Breaking news. Canon released a sensor with more than 24 stops of dynamic range. That's over 512 times what you get out of a top full frame camera. There are rumors of a secret Sony tool that will allow any of their APS-C cameras to produce truly full frame results. And we have rumors of a new Fuji camera and new lenses from Nikon and Sony. But first, I want to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace produces beautiful websites incredibly easy. They have a team of professional designers working for you, creating templates that you can choose from and then customize to match your own personal style. This is by far the best way to present your own photos and video. This is how you show your work to the world, not through social media. Use social media, but bring people to your own website so they can truly see your work presented beautifully. Get started today at squarespace.com slash Tony. The trial's completely free. When you love it, the coupon code Tony gets you 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace. Our top story, this is not a rumor. Nikon released their upcoming roadmap for their lenses and we will soon be getting an 85 millimeter F1 II that matches the 85 F1 II that we love on the Canon platform and I expect to see soon on the Sony platform and a pancake lens, perfect for putting on your Z6 or Z7 when you just want to carry it around your neck, a 26 millimeter F2.8. Now, our biggest story about a Canon sensor that has an incredible dynamic range. This is still only a one inch sensor, but I do believe this technology could be applied to APS-C and full frame sensors in the future to produce truly astounding results with essentially unlimited dynamic range. This sensor is real. It's 12.6 megapixels and it's mostly targeted towards security cameras, but let me tell you about it. It advertises 148 decibels of dynamic range at 1 30th of a second in video. That equates to about 24 stops of dynamic range. Now, by comparison, something like an A7S III or an A7R5 or Canon R5, they tend to have uh, about 15 stops of dynamic range. So, 24 stops is nine stops more than 15 stops. And if you do two to the ninth power, that equals 512 times more dynamic range. So it's gaining just so much more dynamic range. So you'll be able to see the brightest highlights and the deepest shadows. Here's some example images provided by Canon. You can see the histograms on the right. A car is pulling out of a parking garage and the camera needs to take a picture of the driver and the license plate. Maybe he's running a stop sign, maybe he's speeding. In this example, the image is properly exposed to see the driver and the license plate is completely overexposed. In this example, you can read the license plate, but the driver is lost in shadow and you can't make out the face. Obviously, we want to compromise this. Now, if you were taking still pictures, you would probably capture sequential images. You would bracket your photos and then you would combine them. The same technique does work in video, but there can be movement between the individual images being captured and that can produce a kind of screwed up disconnected image and that's the reason we don't tend to use in-camera HDR. Their new sensor provides a unique solution that captures the extreme dynamic range and combines it. The way this works is the sensor is divided out into 736 separate exposure regions, each which can have a separate shutter speed. So they're planning on making this 30 frames per second, which means the longest shutter speed you could get would be 1 30th of a second. That is probably what you would use to expose the darkest shadows to get the driver's face. But then the brightest parts of the image could have a fast shutter speed, like maybe even up to 1 10,000th of a second. And then those different images can be combined. Now, the resulting image here aesthetically is awful. If you were taking a picture of a sunrise or sunset where you need that dynamic range, I don't think you'd be happy with this quality. But for the sake of a security camera, which is very informational, we do see the driver's face, we do see the license plate, and thus it's actually a perfect result. Now, part of the reason this isn't ever going to look great is they are divided into 736 regions, but we have 12 million pixels. And what we really need is to get to the point where individual pixels could be turned on and off and that would provide us the most flexibility for things like landscape images where you and I might be interested in this. Here's Canon's diagrams on how this works. Today, HDR video can work by capturing four separate images within the 1 30th shutter speed that you would have at 30 frames per second. One of those exposures would be at 1 1 20th of a second. That would be the longest possible exposure if you had to divide it up four times. 
and the other shutter speeds would be significantly shorter. Those shorter shutter speeds would allow proper exposure for the brighter parts of the image that are in full sunlight. So maybe your shutter speeds would be 1 1 20th, 1 2 40th, 1 500th, and 1 1 1,000th. And that 1 1 1,000th would be exposing the bright parts of the image, and the 1 1 20th would be exposing for the shadows. And that would essentially give you four extra stops of dynamic range over which you could otherwise do. Now, in their example here, different parts of the sensor can be exposed differently. So you could essentially have a 1 30th shutter speed, but you would shut off gathering light from some of the regions early. So you could shut off one of the regions after 1 1,000th of a second. Other regions could continue to gather light until 1 500th of a second had passed, or 1 240th of a second, or 1 1 20th of a second. Here's the advantage. With the previous HDR technique, where you took four separate exposures within a single 1 30th of a second, the maximum amount of time for a 30 frames per second video, each exposure could maximum be 1 1 20th of a second, and that doesn't necessarily gather enough light for the deepest shadows. With this technique, you can gather light for a full 1 30th of a second, gathering two additional stops of light, four times more light for those shadows. So you're really improving the image quality of the darkest shadows. Now, the maximum dynamic range itself is going to be determined by using those shadows as a baseline and then considering the fastest possible shutter speed for any one of those regions. So I did some math and determined that I think the maximum, the shortest electronic shutter for one of those regions would be about one ten thousandths of a second, which makes sense. That's a common maximum shutter speed for things like security cameras. Um, essentially, if they just wanted to crank up the specs here, they could uh, just continue to provide shorter and shorter shutter speeds. It wouldn't be necessarily meaningful though, because even one ten thousandths of a second with any sort of reasonable lens that you might have on a security camera would allow for exposing basically the brightest parts of nature that you might see. Things in full sunlight or somebody shining a flashlight directly at the camera. You're never going to see stuff brighter than that, so there's no reason for them to go beyond that. You might ask, how do they determine the proper exposure for different parts of the image? And I'd hope they might be able to, to monitor each of the individual regions in real time and figure out, okay, this region has gathered enough light, we should shut it off here. But the way they do it is they uh, look at the data from the previous frames and assume some sort of movement. So they can track the movement of bright subjects throughout the frame and then uh, extrapolate that and determine what the exposure should be. So it might be a little bit imperfect, but it's only going to at most be off by 1 30th of a second in the scenario where you're doing 30 frames per second video. I see it also supports 60 frames per second video. Now this seems novel and unique and exciting, and I can't wait to see something like this applied to our big interchangeable lens cameras, but it's actually not that unique. Like Nikon made an announcement right about a year ago of almost an identical sensor a one inch sensor that advertised 134 decibels as opposed to Canon's 142 decibels. And that was in a 17 megapixel sensor instead of a 12 megapixel sensor. So just one stop better, which means maybe their maximum shutter speed was just one five thousandths instead of one ten thousandths of a second. So it's not particularly novel. It has been done before. But I still think it's exciting to think about the implications, mostly because we haven't seen any real revelations in camera sensor technology in many years. Basically, your brand new camera produces technically the same images as a camera from five years ago. On to some Fuji news. Fuji Rumors is reporting that Fuji will have a new camera this year, the XS20. Now, this is a follow-up to the XS10, which is a few years old right now. This is going to be an entry-level, basically cheapest possible camera that you can get, but it gets people into the Fuji system, a system that we really love. Be sure to subscribe to this channel so you can see our full review when it's out. Sony Alpha Rumors is reporting a couple of really interesting rumors. Well, moderately interesting. The first one is Sony will be releasing a 500mm f4. And I totally believe this because they have a 600 millimeter f4. That's our main wildlife lens. And it's thirteen thousand dollars or so, and they don't have a 500 f4. But we have the Olympics coming up in 2024, and camera manufacturers need to get these big lenses out. So we're seeing this and a 300 f2.8 that Sony officially announced 
coming soon. They were big gaps in the lineup. Of course, they're going to make these no surprises. But what is surprising is that Sony Alpha Rumors suggested that we were going to be seeing a speed booster. Now, a speed booster is the opposite of a teleconverter. Both speed boosters and teleconverters have a crop factor that you multiply both the focal length and the aperture by to determine the results you get from the lens. So a common teleconverter is a 1.4 times teleconverter. You would take 500 millimeters and multiply it times 1.4 to get you to 700 millimeters. And then you take the aperture, like 4, and multiply that times 1.4 to get you to f5.6. As a wildlife photographer, I use this all the time to get a little more reach. All a teleconverter does is just takes the focus light beam out of the back of the lens and expands it a little bit so the sensor is seeing a smaller portion of the image circle. The red box here represents the camera sensor. If we attach a 1.4x teleconverter to the lens, the entire image circle spreads out. Now the sensor stays the same size, but the image circle is bigger, so the sensor is seeing a smaller part of the image coming from the lens. Speed boosters work the opposite. They shrink that in specifically for smaller sensors. Speed boosters have crop factors of less than one. So a common speed booster crop factor is 0.71. So you could take your 50 millimeter lens and multiply that times 0.71 and you would get a shorter, faster lens. Now, if you were to put that on a full frame sensor, of course, all the edges would go dark because the image circle would not be big enough to cover the entire sensor. These are useful when you want to use a full frame lens on an APS-C sensor. What Sony is rumored to be doing is producing a speed booster that would be for E-mount lenses on APS-C E-mount cameras. So now I could take an amazing lens like my Sony 50 millimeter F1.2, put the speed booster on and get results exactly like a full frame 50 millimeter F1.2 on my APS-C cameras like a Sony A6400 or a Sony ZV. E10. That would also allow me to, for example, put my Sony A1 into APS-C video mode, 1.5 times video mode, where it generates less heat and can operate at faster frame rates while still getting full frame results. So it does have useful implications for both full frame and APS-C shooters. What makes this novel is no speed booster like this has ever existed. All existing speed boosters attach DSLR lenses to mirrorless cameras. And the width of the speed booster is the difference in the flange distance. So because mirrorless cameras are thinner than DSLRs, you have some distance that you can make up and the optics exist in that so they don't change the focus distance. This is going to be a speed booster that exists within a single mount at the same flange distance. And nothing like this has ever existed. And that makes me wonder why this has never existed in the past. Because if a teleconverter can expand the light without changing the effective flange distance of the lens, why can't a speed booster contract the light in exactly the same way? There must be some technical challenge to it because nobody's ever done it, but there is certainly a market for it, a huge market for it. Maybe Sony has finally figured out how to do this. It's just a rumor, but I really hope it's true because suddenly, all your APS-C cameras would be producing full frame results with the addition of whatever the speed booster is. That means your FX30 could be like your FX3 or maybe even better because smaller sensors can read out faster. Smaller sensors are a little bit easier to stabilize because they're physically smaller. There's less inertia to it. There's lots of advantages to smaller sensors. The big disadvantage is they don't make full frame equivalent lenses for them but now you'd be able to get the best of both worlds. In the comments below, let me know what you think of this and if you would buy it. I, I, I certainly would immediately to take advantage of all those benefits. And I would really hope we could get one for Canon and Nikon to make up for their lack of native APS-C lenses. I wanna thank our sponsor, Squarespace, which makes websites for you, real websites, not social media. Get your own custom domain so you actually look like a professional and not just some beginner. Don't have a gmail.com email address. Don't send people to your Instagram where they're going to get ads for your competitors. Get your own domain, like northropphotography.com is for me. Get your own custom email address and send people to a place you own. Something that's not owned by Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg, something that's owned by you. Get started today at squarespace.com Tony. After you love it, free trial, no credit card required, 
The coupon code TONY will get you 10% off your subscription. Thank you, Squarespace. Bye.